Thank you so much, Diana. And um, I am humbled to be in this presence. And uh, I was asked to talk about Louis Kahn. And um, many of you have probably visited the building this morning. Many of you live here and know the building much better than I do. So um, um, this is going to be a little amateurish what I'm presenting, but hopefully it will you know, create a conversation anyway. So the um, share a, can I actually switch the images or how does it work? Okay, the share, so go to the first image. The share Bangla Nagar, the capital complex here in Dhaka, is probably Louis Kahn's crowning achievement in terms of coalescing modern architecture with the concept of monumentality next. Conceived first as the second capital of Pakistan and then as the capital of the newly independent Bangladesh, Khan used his design to express abstract and idealist notions of American democracy next. In fact, um, Khan in private complained repeatedly that he was never asked to design buildings of equal political significance at home in the United States. Shera Bangla Nagar came to embody Khan's thinking on the relationship of the individual with civic society, a thinking that was deeply informed by Khan's American perspective, US American perspective on government and liberal democracy in the 1950s. As such, Khan's, desi Khan's design may, may seem, um, may be seen as exemplifying what the Spanish critic Ignacio de Sola Morales has once termed as American post-war imperialism. While this accusation would need further elaboration, I would like to frame the question a bit differently. Next. What if we didn't for once consider to what extent the capital complex uh, exemplifies Western political ideology and imported architectural concepts, but instead looked at the way Khan's experience of Bengal architecture and landscape informed his architectural thinking going forward. Such a change of perspective would allow us to do away with tired narratives of center and periphery, and instead to consider this relationship as much more nuanced and complex than is usually acknowledged. I propose to address this question from two different points of view. The first point I would like to make is Khan's absorption of the Bengal landscape and its repercussions in his architectural thinking. Next. I'm showing you here a couple of sketches from the architect's first visit to Dhaka in 1963. They show sailboats on the river, framed in the background by hints of vegetation. It is this aquatic expression that deeply ingrained itself in Kant's understanding of the place. In a lecture delivered at Yale in October of the same year, 1963, Khan explicitly referred to the defining presence of water in Bangladesh. Next. Talking about a prominent feature of his design for the capital complex, namely its sighting within an artificially created lake, Khan explained, and I quote, I have chosen to distinguish the National Assembly from its surroundings by the introduction of a lake, because it's a delta country and all important buildings are on mounds. The molding of the earth to provide a platform upon which to erect buildings became for Khan the foundational act of architecture. Next. This notion is evident very clearly in this early site model that I'm showing you here for the um, National Assembly building, where the geometric shapes seem to emerge out of the surrounding sea, if you want to call it that. Next. And it is evident in the relationship of the buildings to the surrounding lake. Next. If we now move to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, which was constructed between 1966 and 1972, we find a comparable situation. Besides the reflecting pools, the building is surrounded by a pit, next, indicating Kant's rethinking or thinking of the dialectic of digging and erecting mounds as the foundational act of architecture, something I believe he learned from Dhaka. Next. Water would take on a quasi-spiritual meaning as a symbol of the very notion 
of beginning for Khan. Already in 1916, a speech on Voice of America, he related the story of an Indian architect, presumably Balkrishna Doshi, who gave a talk at the University of Pennsylvania. When asked to, to, to comment on the lecture, Khan went to the blackboard and drew what he thought would be an appropriate beginning for a town in India. Aqueducts radiating from a central tower. For Khan, the water tower and aqueducts were now seen as the beginning of a city. Granted, this earlier incident, 1960, suggests that Khan was already thinking of the symbolic significance of water before visiting Dhaka. Next. As a matter of fact, his modern viaduct architecture has developed in variant of urban plans or urban design proposals for Philadelphia, his hometown, take their cue from the aqueducts of Rome, whose ruins Khan was so fascinated with. However, I would contend that the Dhaka experience reinforced this understanding of water as a symbolic beginning of civilization, and his buildings are a powerful invocation of this foundational myth. The second aspect I would like to address in conclusion very briefly deals more specifically with questions of architectural aesthetics. Next. The plan for the National Assembly building has often been compared to fortification architecture, be it the medieval European castles or the forts of Rajasthan. Next. Its plan of the National Assembly also is reminiscent of idealists, idealized central plans of the Italian Renaissance, as they were, for example, republished in Rudolf Wittkewer's architectures, Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism from 1949, which had an outsized influence on contemporary architectural discourse throughout the 1950s. Next. What I'd like to point out, though, is the peculiar sighting of the individual buildings of the capital complex on an artificial platform, a situation that I'm showing you here that I think is comparable to that of Mughal architecture. Similar to these historical precedents, Khan makes use of reflecting pools, an octagonal plan, and the articulation of the facade with shadowed porches. Next. There also seems to be uh, they there also seems to be a reference to Mughal architecture in the color scheme. The white marble of the sandstone of the Taj Mahal complex relates to the exposed concrete of the assembly building and the surrounding red brick hostel buildings. Next. All of this ex is executed not in a, super, a superficial formalist way, but through a thorough analysis of underlying abstract architectural principles. What results is a truly cosmopolitan architecture that is as much rooted in its place as it speaks to architecture as a universal discipline of placemaking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martino. In order to give some more time to sound troubleshoot, and you must fix the sound, uh, we'll, whoa, uh, we'll stick with the East Pakistan theme and move on to Maria Lukman, uh, who I also have to thank because she's going to be speaking about Shahid Sajad, and that was the most difficult loan in Dhaka Art Summit, and it's all due to her tenacity. So thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, okay, there we are. So basically, um, for those who may not know Shahid Zwag, he's a sculptor. Um, he was born in United India, uh, migrated to Pakistan, and then um, formed his artistic practice through travels. That's how he learned his skills. Um, so I'm going to speak about his time that he spent in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Um, but, okay, so um, just to give a background, the 60s okay, in Pakistan were really complex. Um, and the artists were not the only people who were turning to the pastoral theme. It was the government of General Ayub Khan. And he had come up with this concept of basic democracy to challenge um, the legitimacy of a parliamentary system, which had been inherited by, you know, under the British rule. And this program of restructuring with an emphasis on rural development was regardless 
just as problematic as it was defining, especially in terms of foreign policy, and effective in bringing to the helm of statecraft the army, the bureaucracy, the rural population, the industrialists, the new left, and the old communists. Pakistan, however, in the 1960s was still very much an agriculture-based economy, and the benefits of industrialization were largely uneven. The rural bias of basic democracy had been largely managed to conceal the extent of labor unrest and problems of extreme economic and income disparity between what were then the east and west wings of uh, Pakistan. Okay, so it's in this time that Shahid decides to turn and travel to the jungle heartland of the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Um, so how his journey begins is in combination, uh, in collaboration with a friend. Um, and what they do is they get to um, the northern part of uh, Bangladesh with the border of India, and they travel to the jungles called Sajik. They travel upstream, the river Karnafuli, and um, they get to Sajik to find out that it's not really what Shahid wants. However, the journey back was just as complex and arduous, and he ended up at this settlement, uh, which was called Marisha. Could we have the next slide, please? Next. Okay. And so he ends up at this settlement, which is called uh, Marisha. Um, and this was a settlement of a um, variety of indigenous populations that were displaced w because of the, their villages were flooded um, to build the Kaptai Dam. So as a result, um, what happens is that this is in the aftermath, this is years in 1965, and uh, this is post um, the 1965 war between India and ba Pakistan. And so the jungles are full of the army, but um, Shahid is considered to be harmless because he's uh, just an artist and a sculptor. And in fact, the army helped him um, set up a studio and find a space. And this is how he sets work. Uh, may we have the next slide? So he spent around um, two and a half years um, being in and out of the jungles, um, various stints of continuous stay. And what he started to do was um, start carving using techniques that he had primarily acquired in Indonesia, um, followed by friendships in Japan. His tools were sent to him to the jungles um, by his Japanese colleague and friend, the one who used to write letters to him. Um, and the wood that was found, uh, all of this is found wood. Um, and. Uh, he set off carving, almost taming um, a material which he had never worked with. Um, so I can, no, just could you go back? So I start with the figure on the extreme right. Um, that's man with the burden. Um, then you have woman, uh, kind. Then you have woman in agony, which went on to the Seoul Olympic Park. Um, I'll skip some, um, you know, so there are all these women kind series, women bathing, mother and child, um, man looking to the horizon, and so on. So these were the works that survived, and um, these were first shown in 1974 in Karachi. Um, so the, the adventure of the survival of these works is also um, complicated because, um, you know, we were approaching the 70s, we were coming close to 1970, and he knew he had to go back to, to Karachi, which is where he had traveled from. And on the journey back, um, you know, downstream, he lost most of the, the works to the, to, the, to the river flow. Um, so these were the surviving works that made it back to Karachi, which he finished in his studio. Um, so these have some, been something that remained with Shahid um, for a long time. Um, 
most of them are the ex still existing in various collections with the family or with friends. Um, so as Diana had already mentioned, uh, when we speak of the history of sculpture in the region, uh, Shahid's work, for instance, is always attributed to his encounter with Gauguin at the Louvre. Not much is sort of acknowledged uh, or even spoken about in terms of his association and his time that he spent with the indigenous people. So if he, um, and, and the, the, the rigid uh, borders, uh, or the borders that have become more rigid in time ha have made things a little bit more difficult. And as Diana said, this was the most complicated loan to figure um, to bring to, to Bangladesh. And, um, you know, we, we worked uh, quite hard to, <laughs> to get as many pieces as possible, um, you know. However, uh, what we managed uh, is, again, I think, you know, what I'd like to also maybe share is how much individuals um, contribute towards preservation, towards um, sharing, towards facilitating, because all these efforts are either by a family in Pakistan or a group of people, and likewise, a family and a group of people here, which is completely outside the uh, regulations of you know, the mainstream politics. Between mainstream politics, between um, our countries, so just to end, um, I'm going to, if you just could play the slides quickly. Um, you'll see, um, you know, this was the sort of studio uh, packaging as we were trying to get there. And if you stop uh, one back. Yeah, one back. One, okay. So um, if you see the, you know, you, if you go to Diana's uh, section, curated section, you'll see Hostage 2 um, on display. And the Hostage series um, were not carved out of wood made in Bangladesh. They were, in fact, carved out of wood made in, wood sourced from Pakistan. Not made, sorry, sourced from the jungles of Pakistan. And um, the difference is, um, if you, if you, if, you, if you study the work, you will see how uh, vocabulary is continuously evolving from you know, what, was, um, what was experienced living um, with the indigenous people um, and how that vocabulary gets transformed to uh, Pakistan where it's a different kind of indigenous um, tribal cultures that exist. And, um, in, in terms of um, effort and uh, preservation, I would say that these crates were made by the artists. The notes in terms of um, how to install the work um, have stayed this way. And uh, to bring them back to Dhaka is also um, after 1993, at the last uh, uh, Asia Art Biennial where the stickers still exist. So if you go forward, please, go forward, go forward. And then, oh, it's, uh, you can't see it, but you see the, 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 at the base, you still have the Asia Art Biennial uh, markings, um, the sixth Asia Art Biennial markings. So we were hoping to bring the whole family here. So if you go to the next slide, um, we can see what, we managed, um, so we managed to bring this piece. And then if you go to the next one, um, these are the ones we didn't manage to bring. Um, so, so even though um, there was no shortage of time or effort or uh, will, um, you know, this is how things are. And in, in a way, they also are a testament to um, um, you know, how fragile not only are uh, the, the, the issues surrounding ecology, displacement, rights of indigenous people, um, but uh, it's an under, under-investigated um, area. So 
again, sticking with the East Pakistan uh, strand, we'll head over to Mustafa Zaman, who's going to be speaking about uh, the Bangladeshi modern sculptor, Novera Ahmed. Here you go, Mustafa. Thank you very much, Diana. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm still living in the 20th century. <laughs> 1915. This should be 2005. <laughs> Two zero. <Short> life. <laughs> yeah, it's a short life. <laughs> uh, negative life. Uh, negative life. <laughs> okay, so if, before, um, uh, you know, uh, to lay, lay the ground at first, you know, the background, um, I would say that, that if, uh, there are two different itineraries discernible as far as Novara's oeuvre is concerned. Uh, like, he, she appeared in the uh, art scene uh, around the mid-1950s and had her first solo exhibition in 1960 and it was a runaway success. So as far as media cover is concerned, you, you'd be able to find many. Uh, although researchers would um, rue over shortage of um, uh, materials. But that's how it is, used to be in, in Bangladesh, in East, in East Pakistan. Uh, it, it became Bangladesh in 1971, as we all know. So, uh, next, next, please. Yeah. The first, the, uh, the physical itinerary. Like, uh, she went to London in 1950 and joined the Cumberwell School of Arts and studied art um, under the tutelage of uh, Carol Vogel. And she also came into contact with Jacob Epstein, uh, the famous uh, uh, sculptor. And she went to Florence uh, with his friends uh, in 1955, studied there, uh, received training under uh, Venturi, no, Venturi, Italian sculptor, and then came to, back to Dhaka in 1956. And she started to work, uh, started her work in her studio, in her private studio, and had a solo in 1960. And then she exhibits in Lahore in 1961, and after that, uh, uh, she exhibited in Bangkok, went to Thailand, and also went to Nepal. And uh, these experiences sort of uh, seeped into her system because uh, she woke up to the, the so-called primordial spirit of things, you know. And uh, as, far as, as far as her uh, spiritual journey is concerned, uh, next slide, please. So uh, she frequently, w when in Dhaka, she frequently visited the uh, Sufi spaces around Dhaka and across Bangladesh. And uh, as you would be able to see uh, once we go into the slides that her style changed in the 1970. 1970 onward, she started working on things that are primordial. I mean, if you look at the form, she sort of abandoned the concept of truth to material, which is uh, beholden to modernist canon, and also form specificity, which is one of the most important uh, um, feature of modernity. Parisian avant-garde, I would say, rather than modernity, because Parisian avant-garde is the beginning of, of uh, modernity. In a sense, uh, the way we look at modern art in Bangladesh. So the, in the uh, next, next, in the embryonic art scene in the 1960s, she sort of appeared like a comet. And uh, Navira Ahmed played a pivotal role in reshaping the concept of sculpture, concept of modern art, I would say. Next. So this, this is the, this is what epitomizes the personality, the person she used to be. Uh, Novera Ahmed with the snake named Desire. So that, that's, that's the essence of Novera, the sculpture, uh, the metal sculpture she made in 1972. And this is the cover of the, of the 1973 um, uh, solo exhibition she had in Paris. So she left Bangladesh for good, uh, remained in Paris till her death in 1950, uh, 2015. Again, I'm, I'm living in, in the 20th century. <laughs> so this is the, this is the beginning, I, I would say. The, it's a huge piece. Usually she, uh, she was um, used to ma making uh, huge pieces. Uh, Novera's, next please. Her creative genius can only be understood in the plural because she went through a sinuous line of praxis. 
her sudden death in May, uh, I've got it right now, <laughs> 2015 finally ended her self-imposed exile in Paris, adding another layer to the apparently unresolvable puzzle her personal life has become to people who are inquisitive about her life and lifestyle, because she had a different kind of lifestyle, never got married. And uh, the uncontained explosion of artistic spirit that we were, um, we were able to, uh, would be able to see in the next slide, because this is the Mm, this is Dhaka's first public sculpture, Navera built. So, uh, you know, in a Muslim country where there were reservations about, you know, sculpted materials, sculpted things, uh, of course, this is a misunderstanding because religion has nothing against art. It is only about imagery and that you sort of instrumentalize as, as something uh, devotional. Mm. <clears throat> in your pr use, use it in your prayer. So there's a bar against that. But as far as art is concerned, Mughal art is an, is an important point of, uh, used to be an important point of departure for India. And th th this is Dhaka's first public sculpture. It is called Family. It's poured concrete. This is how it used to work in Dhaka, uh, with concrete. And later on, she started uh, working with metal, as you can see next. So two works by Novera. So Novera was negotiating avant-garde, Parisian avant-garde, simultaneously negotiating Parisian avant-garde and, and rural um, uh, uh, traditions. So you can see that uh, these are uh, sourced from uh, rural dolls, terracotta dolls. Uh, so the tradition sort of melded with uh, both the traditions. Uh, this, is, this is what primitivizing principle sort of brings into view. Uh, because uh, you can call it, next please, next slide, you can call it, you can name it vernacular modernism to borrow Jeffrey Bauer's trope, because Bauer is the architect who came up with this particular concept of indigenous modernity, contextual modernity. So that's, that's how we are able to uh, give basis to the practices of Kamrul Hassan, Esim Sultan, and Zainul Abidin. I, I'm, I'm going to cluster her among them because uh, she, she the Harvard, this particular idea of modernity where you simultaneously negotiate both your context and, uh, and uh, modernity, which is beholden to Parisian avant-garde. Next. Okay. <laughs> so with this, um, I would say that her uh, tendency sort of, uh, this, is, this, is the, uh, this is the cut-off point because this is how with this, this is called Exterminating Angel, built in 1960. This is where she sort of developed a tendency to uh, move away from modernity, you know, the classicist modern uh, conception of uh, sublime and beautiful um, uh, form-specific uh, um, uh, architecture of objects. So next. So this is what uh, she is sort of plunged into, small sculptures, metal sculpture, and she started transcend transcending gender and also transcending the concept of objecthood, uh, I would say. So uh, the primordialist in, him, so in her sort of uh, uh, become the most important, the dominant um, uh, theme. So here is Angkor. I, I think it's a reference to the place in India, uh, a holy place. And next, oh, this is Angkor, and uh, this is a reference to the holy place in India. And next, Mad Baron, as you can see, the demonic aspect of human nature. Jin, we are all familiar with Jin. Next, Jin, uh, it's a reference to the Quranic um, I, um, I entity, not a human being but you can be possessed by the gene. So next. So this is what, what constituted the, the uh, uh, 1973 exhibition of Novera. Uh, she started living there um, and later on got married to, to this guy who had a talk this morning at the National Museum. Uh, <laughs> 1972, next. La Danse du Soleil, uh, the sun dance. Um, um, and it all began in Dhaka because next, 
It all began in Dhaka because she was trying to transcend her reality. The reality is uh, the lived experience, everything, you know. Next. Yeah, sure. So we can go through the slides, you know, one by one, because uh, her paintings, in her paintings, you'll be able to see how, how things sort of um, dematerialized into something else, you know, spirits. So she became enamored of the fact uh, uh, that uh, um, material truth is, is, is not, not very important in our life. So what is important is, yeah, that let's go to the last slide. So yeah, the East-West dichotomy, she sort of uh, uh, abandoned a long time ago. And uh, thank you very much. So. Thank you, Mustafa. And you can see some of Novera's works uh, downstairs in Devika Singh's beautiful exhibition, Planetary Planning. And continuing in that strand of thought, I'll now pass the mic to Junir Kibria, who will speak about his father, Mohammed Kibria. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here to share some thoughts about my father, Mohammed Kibria. Uh, let's see if the slide starts. There he is, smiling. Um, so a few f little facts about him. Um, he was born in Birbhum, India in 1929. Uh, he went to government art college in Kolkata where he studied painting and drawing and he received a teaching offer to come to Bangladesh in 1954. Uh, while he was teaching, he received a scholarship to go to Japan. So, the next slide please. So, before he went to Japan, he was painting these in modernist fashion, you know, cubist with classical themes um, such as the horse, the moon, <laughs> with very romantic ideas of nature. The next one. Um, this is another example with the Grand Odalesque style. But um, for me, I think it's important to point out that the background is just as important as the subject matter, the foreground. Um, if we fragment and look at the background, it those elements become indicative of his future style that he embraces. Um, so this is not his work. It's actually his sensei's work, uh, Hideo Hagiwara. So when he went to Japan in 1959, um, he became, um, uh, Hagiwara became his mentor and guide. So here in this print, I want to point out that this is abstraction. Uh, he was finding these material, the wood, the raw material. Um, it's, it's um, you know, a piece of printed wood on the paper. And he often blocked each side of the paper so the ink would show through. So this is a slower read for a viewer. You really have to see the details within the texture to understand this piece. You have to slow down in order to appreciate something like this. Um, so, but at the same time in Tokyo, uh, where he was living, it was a gateway. He experienced jazz for the first time that influenced him or inspired him throughout his life. Um, but as... Tokyo University was a multidisciplinary university. He had colleagues from all discipline, engineer, biologist, and uh, scientists that helped him to see the world. Um, not only that, I believe he, he also experienced other exhibitions such as abstract expressionism from America that was happening at the same time, but also Japan, J Japan Japanese response to ABEX, which was the Gutai, as well as Spanish influence in abstraction, uh, Antonio Clave, Tapis, and et cetera. Um, so it became a culmination of exchanges that was taking place with him. Next one. Uh, here's an image of two boys, my father as a boy, before when he went to Japan. And uh, he, the one on the left is lithograph that he printed in Japan uh, when he was studying. So I, I would like to point out, and it's important, the negative space that's forming around the subject, the fluidity of motion that's taking shape around the boy. Um, so he's creating these 
spatial atmosphere that will carry out throughout his career. Next. And no subject matter at all, just the atmosphere. So this is an Italia title garden. Once again, another lithograph where we see these um, gestures, but within those gestures are these spaces of atmosphere that we have to look in. And for me, it's a lot about inner contemplation. Um, this is a photograph he took while he was in Japan, so that's how his prints were displayed behind this ikebana, so this dichotomy between the natural element as what he was printing. Um, so while he was experimenting with new elements, uh, new processes such as lithograph and printmaking, he was also experimenting with shape, uh, anamorphic shapes. Um, he's actually taking a close look, and for me, there is a pull between the micro and the macro, between personal and collective experiences, between contemplation and process. Um, there's atmospheres that's created by nature and space, but how do we fit into that? What is it to be immersed in a printed image? Um, I believe my father's work gives us space to reflect, a personal reflection on something that's much bigger than us, but at the same time, just as small as us. Uh, another example. Um, so when he returns from Japan, this is in the hostel at the art college. This was his studio by his bed, his painting. Um, so the things he learned from the process, from lithography, intaglio, he started to incorporate those in painting, pushing the paint, letting the paint breathe, and having it just, well, letting the pigment flow in that fluidity and letting the canvas just be breathing. Next one. So this is his um, definitive style or the, um, a masterwork that defines him, his characteristics. So it's about atmosphere for me. Uh, here are some family photographs. Um, his colleague or his classmate for, in 1960, when he was in Japan at Tokyo University, she came to Bangladesh uh, for an exhibition. Um, uh, her name is Noriko, I'm going to mispronounce her name, so forgive me. It's Noriko Yanagisawa. Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> So she was in an exhibition in 2002, and my father's work was incorporated with her. So our home became sort of a hub where people came, and you know, it was a studio uh, all over practice, and they shared ideas and knowledge. Um, next one. And the last slide, this is, our home was actually built by Mazarul Islam. <laughs> And uh, that's my father in front of our home where his studio was and with the artist. And that is it. Thank you so much, Junior. So you can see, I mean, uh, Bangladesh and Bengali, cult, or Bengali modernism is deeply inspired by Japan, and you can see it in different references, like from the Abedindranath Tagore in the Rakib Shah project and the Asian Art Biennial show. Um, I am told the sound is now working. So given that uh, Kibri and Musar al-Islam had such a friendship uh, and the studio space that you just showed, I think it's fitting to move on to Nur Khan, and then I'm very excited to hear Jack Garrity to, next. যখন ফিরেছিলাম আমাকে আপনার ওতে জানেন না আমাকে অ্যারেস্ট করা হয় অ্যারেস্ট করে আমি আমাকে সলিটারি কনফাইনমেন্টে রাখা হয় তিন তিন দিন সলিটারি কনফাইনমেন্ট কি সাংঘাতিক জিনিস এটা এমনি বোঝাতে পারবো না আপনাকে একটা ঘরের ভিতরে বন্ধ করে রাখা ফর নাথিং আর কিছু মানে একজন লোককে আপনি দেখতে পান তার চেহারা দেখতে পান না তো ওরকম তিন দিন রাখা তারপরে আমাকে এক বছর আমাকে হাউসের রাখা হয়েছিল but it was great for the people at some level to have him as their standard bearer. 
which Muslims are meaning the flag bearer of Islam, right? And he sort of was, but not of Islam, the religion, but he was the flag bearer of Bengalis, of people from East Bengal. Ekta tarunatse je ami na ki architecture niye ko beshi bada bari kori. To Bangladesh architect bolte or that architecture some munde shikha bevosta kono kichhi chilo na. Ekono jeta achi shita truncated shampuno jeta thaka uchi tar shero kam kichhi nai. तो ये तो एम ऑन एक तो विषय जिता उत्तम तो कॉम्प्लिकेटेड आर्ट फॉर्म अमार आप बच्चे लेन प्रोफेसर मानुष एवं पॉलिटिकल इत्ता दी ऐसा भी खूब शांत शिष्ट है ऐसा भी हंगामा ही चलेन ना इंटर आमी जो कौन इन्वॉल्व हुए पुरी पर छोटे वाला थे कि तो कौन उन कौनो बारा दरने तो कौन आमी थकता धन मंडे आमर कोरा डिजाइन निभाई डिजाइन करो भाई जाए ओ मो ये संगी जो कुन गोल बाल है तो कुन ये ये ढाका छेरे चले जाए आरो आतियो सोचें तारा मूव करें तो कोरोटी है तो हमरा एक टा बाड़ी तो चिला प्राय नब्बू जन एक टा जिसे जिसे आर्किटेक्टर जो भी काज करते हैं architecture Architecture is a very difficult thing. Picasso is a very difficult thing. But, Luisa, Luisa. When I was young, 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 अरे आमी पॉलिटिकल पार्टी बोलते आमी जोड़ी तो चलें किंतु ठीक वही भाभी पॉलिटिकल लेना आमी मूलों तो सार्विक पॉलिकल्पन और व्यापार नहीं आमी जोड़ी तो चलें आमादे चिंता है तो कौन चिलो जे सभी गुच्छी करा जाए गुच्छी करे एक एक ता डेवलपिंग प्लान में एक ता बेसिक आइडिया ता निये तार पर जेमन नोदी एक टा जाते हैं तो नोदी टा पानी कतु कहीं थक बे की ना ये गुनो नोदी जरा एक्सपर्ट तादिक के संग कथा वाचो बोले तादें डिसाइड डिसीजन नहीं तार पर एक की भावे ये नोदी टा व्यवहार करा जाए मानुष शर्ते पानी दोपहर से नोदी धार इत्ता दी एवं ट्रांसपोर्ट सिस्टम समस्तिक चीज � अनेक किसी जगह करे तार परे ऐटा ऐटा इतिहास से संगे जोड़ी तो अमान नानी जे जीवन से संगे जोड़ी तो नीजे चोक देखा देखा जीनी से संगे जोड़ी तो तार परे इतिहास आमादेर आराय हजार तीन हजार चार हजार पांच हजार पच्चीस हजार पूरों नहीं इतिहास नहीं जोड़ी तो अल्टीमेटली एक टा आइडियल आमान नीजे म कॉन्सेंसेस था का दरकार है जेटर तो नेशनल मिले सवाई मिले ऐटा उद्देश्य रखा जाए जाए अल्टीमेटली दोष बच्चे पन्नर बच्चे बीस बच्चे पंचर बच्चे पर ये ये आमादर आमादर समाज दारा बे ऐटा निजेर नाती नाती जो ने जो दिच्छिंता है ताले ऐटा सदार देशे सवार जो निच्छिंता करता है आर इतने डिग्री नहीं हो जो नहीं तो ना आर्किटेक्चर इसे कंप्लीटली इट्स लाइक पेंटिंग पेंटिंग है तो स्कूले पढ़ा कॉलेजे पढ़ा किच्छू मारी है ना एक्चुअली यू कैन नेवर क्रिएट फ्रैंकलिन राइट और तो रोहित ठाकुर 
So we had an argument, Lucan and I, about Islam, because Lucan never understood, didn't like Islam's spending as much time as he did on politics, the Awami League and all that. And he couldn't understand that uh, architecture by itself couldn't solve East Pakistan's problems, not Bangladesh's problems. So Islam was acknowledged as the father of Bangladeshi or East Pakistan architecture. No question. I thought that these words should come from him and you get the chance to look at his eyes and hear him speak what he actually thought uh, the purpose of architect was in his time. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that the purpose of all art is truth. Nothing can be more true than our place in time. Mazrul Islam in his work must, have, must be seen as more than just architectural work of his time, but as the consciousness of his time. It is this consciousness that should inspire us to understand that no matter who we are and where we stay, we should be able to resist, react, respond, and speak out of things beyond our personal and geographical boundaries. Last night, Diana spoke of resistance. I, in the voice of Mazar Islam, asked the same and even more in the form of activism. Today, increasingly, as we see architecture becoming self-referral, architecture for architects, for jury panels, awards, medias, and publications, in this euphoria of self, we will lose our ability to serve a greater purpose. Islam's body of work has driven by his politics of nation building and his politics of other than myself. He imparted upon him the responsibility to give a vision for a nation and a direction for its people. He saw architecture more than a profession. His work, therefore, should be a calling for architects, artists, writers, and thinkers alike. We all exist in a place and time. And that time has its own calling. And now, how we respond to that calling will be the true measure of us, not the objects that we leave behind. But the courage we show, the resistance we build, and the voices we speak out in, this will be the duty of our time. Today, um, standing in Dhaka Art Summit, when I see collapsing of boundaries and sharing of minds, I am hopeful that we will be able to respond to what will be the calling of our time. Mazar al-Islam has left uh, giving the architects of this country this inspiration that we have the ability to perform for others and to perform well in our time. I think the understanding of time and what's happening right now is very important for all of us. I'm going to provide a, a, a bit of a different perspective because instead of talking about a Bangladeshi artist, um, it's going to be the first foreign artist who worked and painted in Bangladesh. About four, almost 40 years ago to the day, Pasita Abad arrived in Dhaka. Um, she was just coming in from New York and basically out of art school. And, uh, you know, people, when she told people in New York she was going to Dhaka back in the mid 70s, they looked at her like she was crazy. Um, but she, she had been used to traveling overseas because a few years before, she and I hitchhiked for a year going from Istanbul to the Philippines. So if you talk about how do you find Asia, she started in Istanbul and, and worked her way east. Uh, and she, on this trip, just fell, fell in love with Asia, uh, going through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, spending three months in, in India, uh, another month in, in Sri Lanka, and in particular, she was, she was mesmerized by the colors, and, and particularly the women. She always said the women that she's encountered were like walking pieces of art, and she just, she just loved to, to paint them. She, South Asia played a, a very important role uh, in her career. And uh, she came back to South Asia many times, uh, in, in so much so that she devoted a whole series to, uh, as a homage to Rajasthan. 
Uh, in particular, she, she learned how to incorporate mirrors into a lot of her work, and she used it over in the entire career. You'll see this one. This is the largest painting she ever did. And this was taken from Sri Lanka, from a Sani exorcism mask. And she did this as a political motif. She was living in the Philippines at the time, and she wanted to exorcise uh, the dictator Marcos and his cronies, his corrupt cronies. And she saw this mask and she said, ah, this is Marcos and his cronies. Uh, and it's 20 feet high, and, it's, uh, and now it's in the Singapore Art Museum. When she came to Dhaka in, in, in 1978, uh, I, was, I got a job working uh, in rural development and spent the year tra traveling throughout the country and, and putting together economic uh, studies. Uh, we rented a house in Damundi, uh, in, which was very different then than, than it is now. It was lovely, a lot of old houses and vegetations around the lake, and there were no apartments. She came over, in one of the early days, she came over to Shippakala Academy, and where she met the director, Syed Jangir, sitting here in, in, the, in the first row. Um, and he started giving her lessons about Bangladesh and the art uh, traditions in Bangladesh. And in particular, he introduced her to Zainal Abedin's work. And she, and she was completely taken and mesmerized and, and went right down and, and bought his book and studied it intensely. And he was the inspiration for her to go, decide to get out of her studio and go into the streets and the fields of Bangladesh. And so she started taking rickshaws and going down to old Dhaka, going down to Motajil, down to, and all, all the way down to, uh, Chada got and looking at the scenes and coming back and painting them every day, uh, and it gave it gave her a real sense of of uh, that she was really painting Bangladesh. She wasn't and and she wasn't just staying in her studio. But as as much as she liked Bang Dhaka, uh, she was anxious to get into the field and experience the, the real the countryside. Uh, and her first trip was, was on the rocket. It was down, down through uh, to Kulna. And as she went, she went along uh, on the river and she saw all, the, all these scenes, um, she, she really began to appreciate that, that the life in Bangladesh really revolves ar around the river. And over the course of the year, she traveled from Salat and Rangpur in the north down to Kulna, Chittagong, and beyond in, in the south. Um, but here, you know, the scenes, women bathing in, 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 the, in the river, a Hindu temple uh, in Faridpur, um, on, the, on the way to Narayan Ganj. And, the, and then this inspired her to do the largest painting that she did in Bangladesh, which he calls In Bangladesh which captures you know, life on the, on the river. And as, as, uh, as much as she liked traveling on, on the river, she also traveled by road, which was very difficult in those days. The roads were narrow, there's a lot of vehicular traffic, buses, uh, ox carts, uh, trucks. But she didn't care. Every time we got to a, a ferry, then she would just take out her sketch pad and, and, and sketch. Her favorite place was in Salet, uh, where the Ramdani, Samdani Foundation is now putting up the art center. Uh, and it's, I'm sure it's gonna be quite spectacular because Salet is a very, very nice place. There she was been painted the, the bridge in, in, in going over the Surma River and, and then went into the tea plantations and, and painted you know, the women picking tea. And the women were very happy to, to, to pose for her. As a matter of fact, all throughout Bangladesh, uh, the women were very, very welcoming, so she painted a lot more women than, than men. 
and and even there was there was one time in in Rangpo where, the, where this lady actually stopped uh, Pasita and said, "Paint me," and and forced Pasita to to paint this lady. And then she went down to the, the, um, the to Chittagong, and uh, and then into the uh, Chittagong the hill tracks. And she was particularly interested in, in going there because wherever she went in Bangladesh, people would always say, Chakma, Chakma, Chakma. And she, you know, at first she was puzzled. And then, and then people told her about the Chakma tribe in, in Rangamati. So when she went to Rangamati, she was very pleased to, to see that the, they had a lot of the characteristics of people from her native island. Uh, and it, it, made her, it made her very happy. Then we, would spend, we spent Christmas in, in Cox's Bazaar. And at that time, there, there was only a little guest house in Cox's Bazaar. And there we met uh, a couple of international journalists who were going down to Technef. So we asked if we could go along, and we went down there, and there were the, the Rohingya camps. It was back in 1978, and it was the first time that the Rohingya had come across in such a massive uh, uh, numbers. Um, and it was a precursor to what's happening actually right, right now. And it had such an effect on, on Pasita that when we went to Bangkok uh, next time, we encountered an, another refugee crisis, and that was with the Cambodian refugees. And she went up to the border camps and, and she painted you know, the scenes in, in the border camps and, and did a, a big series on, on the refugees of Cambodia. And she continued in, in going in, in Africa, Sudan, uh, Dominican Republic, a number of other countries doing so similar types of social realism works. And this led up to uh, doing a, a series which is the last of her social realism, which was uh, Immigrant Experience. And this one was painted, it's called LLA Liberty, and is for all the people of color who didn't get recognized. Uh, no, there were no welcome maps out, out for the people of color. Uh, very different experience than, than the Europeans arriving in, in New York City. And she, this was the Haitian, Haitians in, in turned in Guantanamo, uh, and they, were, they weren't let, led into the States. They were stopped and put in Guantanamo. And this was the guy on the Mexican border, caught at the border. And also scenes that this was the Tamil woman who married a, a Canadian guy, and some, something that you're seeing, you know, much more frequently in the last 50 years. She has a, a exhibition coming up in the in the Philippines in, in a couple of months of of her stitch paintings, and many of these also had a Bangladesh connection. Uh, inspired by a lot of the, the Kanta works, the, the story quilts, and her friend uh, Soraya Ramantam Raman. And uh, Pasita ended up doing, in a lot of part of her career, working on abstract works that were sewn and, and uh, mixed media. Thank you, Jack. That was really great, and it's wonderful that you're back in Bangladesh. We only have 10 minutes left, so I think in order to be generous to the audience, I'll open up the floor to questions, and if there aren't any, then we can pick up the discussion. Are there any questions? Mr. Jahangir? Is it working? I think so. Hello. Is it working now? Yes. First, I would. Uh, uh, I was wondering. Uh, why the gentleman who spoke about Navera, I mean, 
did not mention about the Shahid Minar, which was designed. The basic design was done by us. Because in 1956, when Mr. Hamid Rahman and Nabir came from London, I used to visit them quite often. They used to live in a tent. And they were designing the Shahid Minar, the, uh, 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 the language movement uh, signature. And uh, the basic design was done by Nabir Ahmed, although we know it has been done by Hamid Rahman, but they were working together. Hamid was also a very fine artist, and uh, he studied in school of Slade School in London. And he had some paintings. This was a two-storied uh, floor. But the one now we see after the demolition of uh, Pakistan army, uh, there, there is only one floor. There is no ground floor. There was a ground floor, and there were some uh, relief murals done by Navara and paintings done by Hamidur Rahman. And this was a significant work of uh, art by Navera. I don't know, you must have missed it. I would have loved to see it. Because there's this limit, you know, yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's why. And it is also controversial because I, uh, when you refer to that particular uh, architecture, it's, it's a beautiful architecture and everybody knows that uh, uh, the two artists were working together because they were living together, in fact, back then in, in, the, in the 1960s. Uh, the problem is that you don't have people boldly claiming, as, as you have done right here, that uh, Novera was very much part of it. And uh, we have written about it, of course, um, um, but we cannot just uh, say that uh, for sure uh, how much of it came from, I mean, the idea came from uh, Novera and how much of it came from uh, Hamidur Rahman. So that, that's where. I'm just uh, n not quite sure, so that's, I, I, because of that, I, I just skipped uh, it. I and it, it's a 10-minute it's a <laughs> um, presentation. So I was talking about her mainstream, I mean, how she became, became known as an artist, so the mainstream trajectory. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, I wanted to... Yeah, but, but it's an important issue to talk about. We must uh, continue this conversation because we need to be clear about uh, whether Novera was a big part of it or not. Novera's initial education was in London. As you can see, the uh, family, you showed the picture, the cow and then the figure, and you saw the two holes. I mean, it had a lot of similarity of uh, the great uh, sculptor Henry Moore. Yeah, sure. And sure. in many other uh, sculptors yeah. also. You see a, a woman is sitting uh, with, with a back with no shape of a head, but she's, uh, it's like a, uh, a, a chula in a cooker in the villages, uh, the earthen meat, and there is a hole right in front. And also the works you would see that mostly uh, initiated by probably Zainul Abedin, but it was the village dolls that you get in the villages. A lot of figures are like these minis dolls. Yeah, the terracotta figures, yeah. We are familiar with them. I mean, that, that's where the primitive principle sort of comes in. You know, this, this is how, you know, modernists used to work, you know, simultaneously negotiating two things. Or multiple things, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, about Shahid Sadda, uh, he worked in the Chittagong Hill Tract. Uh, do you know if he had left any work in East Pakistan at that time? Uh, and the second question is, did he continue after he had gone back to Karachi? And did he change his style or forms? Um, f to answer the first question, to my knowledge, um, I don't think there are any works of Shahid in Bangladesh today. I could be wrong. Um, I'm also aware that he did meet with uh, Zainul Abidin and they did have an affinity. 
uh, but I, I'm not aware of any further uh, collaborations between them because um, we do know that Zen Rabidin used to um, be in Pakistan and he in fact set up the Department of Fine Art at the University of Peshawar which is again not far from the tribal regions of Pakistan. So that's the first one and the second question was did he continue working? Um, yes he did um, because of the political troubles, because of the coming of the liberation war here, he returned to Karachi with as many pieces of found wood, unfinished works, and they traveled back with him. And um, so the works were completed. Um, it took him nearly 10 years to finish these pieces. So the, the pieces were semi-complete, and, and that's why you notice such a difference in size and scale because they were all found. And so the, 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 the group of uh, works that were the, the, the gray slide um, were shown at the Chokandi Gallery in Karachi in 1974. And then the works that are here today, um, part of the Dhaka Art Summit exhibit, were completed in the 90s. Um, and he followed the same sort of process i.e. using um, found wood um, from the forest jungles and then, you know, working in the same sensibility. So Thank that you. Did I, I must say that he was very much loved by the East Pakistan artists. He was a great art uh, sculptor. He, he, yes. I, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, about Mazar islam If I may, uh, may I, uh, Diana? Can I? Uh, the Mazar al Islam uh, architecture, w only discussion we uh, heard, but we have not, st you didn't show any work of Mazar al Islam. One of the most, most important architecture Mazar al Islam has created is the Arts College, which is now the Faculty of Fine Arts, Dhaka University. Yeah. He showed how nature influences the architecture. Questions. This is a comment, but we're going to be taking tours of the physical building, so that's why it's not here. Um, may I pass? Is there another question? Uh, Thank you, Uncle. Those are very good questions. Thank you very much uh, for this session. It's very eye opening from all of you related to Bangladesh and the history, and especially uh, related to these novelists, Shohid Minar the language uh, martyrs monument in dhaka you all of you might know that this is the uh, bangladesh uh, she language movement became the uh, international mother language day and today we was uh, at the national museum to hear from novera's husband for the first time in last 60 years uh, someone uh, who uh, lived with her for last 50 almost 50 years and he said about the Shohid Minar that, and he confidently said, and he had the evidences that Novera designed the Shohid Minar, and it's not mother and child, it's the hand waving towards the people. I'm just adding this question as it came to the point, you know. And I, I, I also expected, Zaman Bhai, that you, I don't know why you didn't add it, like, you know, I, you are I saying wanted it, to be there, I was it, working on very my presentation, significant of course. Thing. <laughs> it brings, uh, 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 I think, the uh, controversy or whatever, but yeah. she's also part of it, or she's the prime artist, it should this be. This is something new, the, because, yeah. they, I mean, this, this, is very this significant happened, thing. this occurred this morning, so yes. I wanted to be there, but I was late, already late, you know, I, I take care of my two kids and everything, <laughs> <laughs> simultaneously, <laughs> so I'm a father. Thank, <laughs> but it, it's a great presentation, though. Yeah. So it's, it's, Thank you. Privilege to know. Okay, over here, another question. Um, my question is to Mustafa Jaman. Uh, do you think uh, in okay. Novera's vision? I think we have enough. Sorry, because we only we don't have a lot of time. We don't no more Mustafa Zamaning <laughs> right now. Also, oh, can um, I ask so that? You can. Why, we can. Can you ask the question yeah. after? Do you think Mustafa Jaman uh, Novera's work is inspired by some postmodern moments of her time? Thank you. Sorry. 
uh, do you think in Navidas work or visual work there are some postmodern influences or postmodern elements? No, no, no. It, it, it has Thank you. everything to do with modernity and also uh, to transcend uh, what modernity is all about. So that's it. I mean. The next question, person next to Mirella. Hello, I have a general question for everybody. Um, this seems like a really awesome moment to sort of examine how a lot of um, artists felt about working multiculturally. Um, could you, could any of you really elaborate on maybe the differences between inspiration and uh, inspiration, appropriation, um, just like how, how the artists that you know felt about making these early multicultural connections and how they navigated um, just how, how big cultures are? Anybody, really? Excellent question. Who wants to take that? Me? Okay. Sure. Um, so, f for me, that we use influence and inspiration oftentimes without knowing what those are, words are. Uh, I mean, reading about my father that other people wrote or seeing him um, or other people talking about him, they sporadically use the word influence, but seeing his work, I think he was inspired. Everything is a tool for an artist to use what they want to visually create or bring out. It's, it's a language and these languages become a tool for them, uh, at least, or a reflective one. But culturally speaking, when he was in Japan, he was definitely inspired by jazz, that I know. Um, he was also inspired by Zen Garden, about space, how space formed around things. But that was all, it was already there in his work, in his life, how we navigate through space, how we navigate through culture. What do we mean um, when we reflect ourselves within two different cultures? Um, so those values were already there. So I would say we should really reflect on how we use these words, influence and inspiration. I could add to that, and um, based on what I know of Shahid Sajjad's practice, um, I think of it more in terms of how freedom, you know, in 1947 from a long colonial legacy also meant freedom in every, um, in its full breadth. So it meant one could, one really felt a free citizen of the world, and that meant you could travel, you could do as you please and learn um, where you would find uh, some, you know, something that you wanted to learn, you'd, you'd go to it. And so the, 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 the motorcycle journeys by, you know, the South American counterparts are kind of really famous, but, you know, the, for instance, Shahid goes on to his motorcycle journeys in the 50s, which is, you know, before the uh, Sheikh Guevara or any of that uh, kind of a thing. So, so I think it's also m of its time where people did uh, feel free and slightly less hemmed in by borders and, and sort of follow the idea um, to, to, to get to, uh, you know, um, to fulfill their own vision of themselves. Thank you so much to all of you for being here with us. Um, a lot of the works by uh, artists mentioned here are present in the summit. Sadly, Pasita is not, but there's an e-publication, so if you go follow her Facebook page, there's a really nice publication that you can take.